Hello. Welcome. Hi, I'm Lynn Brockington, Community Experience Coordinator at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. Welcome to the second in our series of virtual gardening talks. Today, I'm pleased to have with us Andrea Bellamy to talk about growing food gardens in containers. Andrea Bellamy is the author of Small Space Vegetable Gardens, Growing Great Edibles in Containers, Raised Beds and Small Plots. She has a BA in English from the University of Victoria and a certificate in garden design from the University of BC. Andrea has written about gardening for a variety of magazines and publications and was the garden columnist for Edible Vancouver for several years, winning a silver award of achievement from the Garden Writers Association. Andrea lives in Vancouver with her husband and children, where she grows a wide range of organic edibles, along with blooms for small patch flowers. The social enterprise started in 2019. So in the webinar today, uh, Andrea will talk for about 45 minutes, and then she will answer questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna, um, hello Andrea, hi. Hey, great to see Here. you. Good, hi. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna mute myself and turn off my video and just let you take it from here, okay? Wonderful. Thanks, Lynn. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my um, bike shed, uh, where I'm broadcasting live from East Vancouver. Today, we are talking about um, growing food in containers. So just think about this as a kind of a container edible gardening uh, class 101. Um, we're going to talk about everything you need to get a container garden started, uh, from choosing a container and soil and the plants, to maximizing a yield um, and just having some fun with it. If uh, you're a beginner gardener, I hope I've got lots to share with you all the way through to if this is your 10th or 15th year gardening. Um, we're not just gonna cover edible or containers as well. Um, I will talk about maximize space in all kinds of gardens because let's face it, we can always use a little bit more um, productivity from our gardens. So um, let's dig in. Um, uh, so the reason I got started with container gardening is that it was, it was my only option. Um, I lived in a, a town, a variety of um, condos and townhouses in Vancouver and didn't have any garden space other than what I could create by trucking in soil and, and growing in containers. So um, it, was, it was pretty much the only, my only option if I wanted to grow anything. Now, um, this is such a gloomy, um, apocalyptic looking photo, but um, this is my backyard currently, um, although right now it's decorated with a slip and slide and it's, it's much more sunny than this. Um, I have a lot more space. Um, it's still a small space. It's an urban a backyard, but um, it's huge compared to what I have had. Um, this is my dedicated veggie patch you're looking at, but there's other uh, areas where edibles make an appearance throughout the garden. So. You might ask, if I've got all this space, why garden in containers at all? So even though I now have the option of growing in the ground, um, there are still instances when I will choose to grow in containers um, and why I think you might want to consider it. So the first is convenience. Containers can be moved wherever you would like them to be. And that might be along the path out to your garage so you pass them frequently and can maintain them and enjoy them or it can be um, outside your kitchen window or back door. So there, you can situate them uh, where it works best for you. I also love that containers are portable, whether or not they've got casters on them like this uh, planter, but that can be really convenient um, for moving things around to either bring focus to that container. So say you've got a, a, you know, a lovely little lettuce patch and that's kind of petering out now that the the heat has started and you want to kind of bring something else more into the front of your display. So you can move that, that um, container that it, that's on its way out to the back and um, put, bring focus to something more attractive. Uh, I also, using the lettuce example again, like that we can move containers around to suit the plants that are in them. So um, again, um, you may have started some greens earlier this spring um, but find that they might be suffering when the heat hits. Maybe you're noticing 
um, some brown spots on the leaves or some sun scald. And you think it might be better in part shade and it probably would be. So you can move that container if it's small enough or portable enough um, into a more um, beneficial situation for the plants that are in it. So the other reason I like containers that you basically never have to do this, weeds are pretty much non-existent. Um, you also don't really need that many tools. Like the only reason you, you would need this many rakes in a container garden is for a cute little display like this. I also love that containers allow you to get around any issues that you might have with your existing soil in the ground. Um, so your the native soil might be all boggy or full of clay or even polluted. You can bring in your own perfectly customized soil blend um, that's ideal for growing. You can also get around soil-borne diseases. So um, if, you've, if you've had um, rust, for example, on your garlic, um, you can get around that by growing your garlic in containers in a clean um, potting soil. I also love that containers allow you to customize the soil that you're growing in. So for example, carrots like a really loose, uh, sandy soil so that they can de develop their roots. And you might not think containers would be good for that, but if you've got a deep enough container, you can fill it with really light, fluffy, sandy soil that container that carrots will really enjoy and be able to develop long, strong roots. And as a bonus, you can just tip the container over when you're ready to harvest. Uh, I also love that you can create perfect soil even where there isn't any. So say you've got a parking pad like this backyard here. You can bring in soil and you can create a garden where there might not be any in the ground. You also can take um, advantage of vertical space. So growing up on walls or planters, um, using hanging baskets, it allows you to maximize your space by growing up. Uh, even when space isn't at a premium, I love the design element that a container can offer. So it creates a focal point in the garden. Um, and this, this container um, that I'm showing here, oh, I guess the nasturtiums are edible, but I don't even think the rest of it is, but it, it's in a vegetable garden. And I love how the, like, the rusty um, iron of the pot is playing off of the blue green of the lacinato kale in the foreground. So it's just, a, it can add like a, a nice decorative element. I also really like that containers allow us to grow some things that may be not hardy or borderline hardy in our region, um, such as rosemary, which can suffer if it drops, you know, to minus 10, or trees like um, citrus or bay. Um, uh, this is a Meyer lemon that I have um, growing on my windowsill. Um, and the bonus is that, yes, you can bring it inside. It doesn't have to be to your living room, but into an un unheated garage or a greenhouse or um, any, any area basement um, where you can protect that marginal plant over the winter. The bonus sometimes is being able to enjoy these plants throughout the winter, like getting lemon blossoms uh, in your uh, living room, which just smell amazing. This is just a gratuitous photo, so I can show lemon blossoms, but, um, but it's not all sunshine and lemon blossoms or roses. There are some, um, d some hurdles, and probably the biggest one is watering. Um, containers dry out so quickly in the summer when we don't get much natural rainfall, um, so uh, there's, I will say more about watering, but just for now, I'll say that expect it to be a hurdle and, and plan for it. And I'll talk about how to do that in just a few minutes. Containers require more fertilizing. Plants don't have the same um, soil, either the soil, um, the, the natural organisms occur occurring in soil in the garden, um, or just the amount of soil to be able to draw nutrients from. So let's be prepared to feed them more frequently. And again, I'll say more about how to do that when I talk about maintaining a container garden. Something to consider, um, containers limit plant choice. You're not gonna be growing corn. Um, you can grow almost anything, including small trees and containers, but you have to consider just how big that container is gonna be. And is that really, um, it's not gonna be portable if it's a huge container, for example. Um, some plants, especially large, long-lived perennials like um, rhubarb or asparagus 
aren't, aren't really suited to uh, containers and they're better off in the ground or corn. <laughs> um, containers are not, um, don't protect plants as much as the soil, soil grown plants. So um, if we're growing uh, perennials, something that will live year after year, this is something to consider. Uh, especially with um, things like rosemary, which can be damaged by a really, really cold winter. Um, containers just don't offer the same insulation as the ground does. So um, something to be aware of when you're choosing um, a plant that you want to live more than one season. So if you've, considered, if you've decided, yes, I'm gonna grow something in a container, um, which are the best materials? So let's just talk about that in general. Um, in, in general, bigger is better. Um, you, you see some really cute little decorative containers, but think about um, a, how much you're gonna have to water those in order to keep that plant healthy. Um, it's, it doesn't have a lot to draw from, um, and your plants will be happier, you'll be happier because you won't be watering as often. Uh, but some specific container materials, terracotta, this is a um, classic container choice. Um, in this particular container, I'll just highlight this plant that's growing. It's a um, dwarf raspberry. So you can grow raspberries in containers. Look for dwarf varieties. Um, this one is a brazzleberry, I believe. So terracotta is an, an inexpensive um, container choice. You can find it pretty much everywhere. Pretty attractive. It's got that classic uh, Italian look or uh, Mediterranean look. Um, it's porous, so it has good air circulation, um, and, which is important uh, for container-grown plants. Um, I, I find that Mediterranean herbs love terracotta um, other, and other plants that uh, appreciate dry conditions. Not dry conditions, but don't enjoy being waterlogged. Uh, on the downsides, it, because it is porous, terracotta dries out quickly and the containers uh, are not considered winter hardy. So if they absorb all our winter rain and then we get a hard freeze, often they will actually crack. So you have to be careful if you're deciding to leave them out over, over the winter. Um, glazed ceramic is one of my personal favorite, um, it's probably my the favorite um, container choice for myself. I just love the bright colors and the glossiness. I think they add a really nice um, focal point for the garden. They come in a, uh, a huge range of colors and styles. There's something for everyone. Um, depending on the temperature at which it was fired, it may or may not survive a cold winter freeze, but in general, I find them pretty good. Um, the Vietnamese made ceramics are, the, are considered to be the best uh, quality. And on the downside, they can be very heavy, especially when they're full of soil. Wood, I mean, classic West Coast choice. There's a huge range of styles depending on how it's finished. You can use rough reclaimed pallet wood to, for a kind of a, um, a rustic look um, or something more like this, which is more modern, smooth sand, sanded and oiled for a little bit more modern. Um, on the plus side, wood is infinitely customizable, um, fairly easy to do it yourself uh, and can be affordable. Uh, on the downside, uh, wood of course can be heavy and doesn't last forever. However, I do find that using our cedar wood, untreated cedar, um, which is important when you're growing food, um, can really last for years and is, is very worth the, um, the investment. Let me come to plastic. Um, obviously plastic gets a bad rap these days, um, but there are some pros to it. And it comes in a huge range of styles from something like this, which is unapologetically plastic, like this guy, um, to something that's pretending to be terracotta. Um, again, th this is just, I'll mention this zucchini. Um, this is a patio star uh, zucchini. Um, so again, uh, something that you might not think that you can grow in a container, um, but actually can, because it's a, a variety that's been developed um, for container growing. Um, so plastic pluses, um, it's inexpensive, find it everywhere. It's really lightweight, which is nice. And it um, is pretty durable. Um, can be unattractive, of course. Um, and over time, it'll fade and crack. So it doesn't have that longevity. 
fiberglass is um, becoming more available. Um, in this photo, the fiberglass container is the one um, at the back um, holding sweet potatoes. I really like fiberglass as an option. There's some really modern choices. Um, it has many of the benefits of plastic, but is often better looking. Um, so like plastic, it's lightweight, um, durable, um, but can be attractive. Um, over time, I do find, and I'm talking like 10 plus years, they do um, break down. Um, and I've heard that they can melt, but I've never experienced that personally. Uh, grow bags are um, uh, coming more and more onto the market. There's a few different styles. Um, so I'm using the term grow bag to describe um, a few different types. This type I'm showing here is made from a felt-like breathable polypropylene um, fabric. Um, this one is, is from a company called Woolly Pockets. Um, the other kind, which seems to be um, popular in Britain, is uh, basically like a bag of potting soil that you cut holes into um, and plant, plant directly into it. Um, so this is a high-end grow bag, and I think it's pretty decent looking. Then there's something like a mid-range type. Um, these are potato-specific grow bags from West Coast Seeds. Um, the cool thing about many of these is that they come with a flap at the bottom that you can unzip. Um, so that you can harvest new potatoes um, as they grow just from directly from the bottom. So the trick would be when the plant flowers, you know that that's when it's making the potato and that then you can start taking some of the small potatoes out. Um, so that's pretty cool. And here's the bag of potting soil kind, which I don't have too much to say about, except maybe it might, it would be cheap. Um, so the pros to grow bags would be um, that they would be easy to store for off-season storage or dispose of in the case of the, the bag of potting soil kind. Um, at uh, best they're utilitarian, at worst they're downright ugly, difficult to move um, once they've been filled with soil. And then just a word about um, found objects. So here we have some old wash ba basins stacked up into a tiered planter, um, a feed bin, a woven shop shopping basket. So anything that holds soil can be a container for your, for growing. Um, you know, tin cans, these are Ikea garbage pails, uh, a canoe, um, a pickup truck. Uh, my sister once converted a Barbie Winnebago into a herb planter. Um, so think of just think outside the pot, uh, milk pails, vintage crates and buckets, child's bathtubs and whatever holds soil you can use for, um, for your garden. I love that they can add a sense of uniqueness and whimsy um, and yeah, really using something unexpected. So the downsides would be potential lack of drainage holes, which you might need to drill, uh, need to refinish them in some way. So now just a shout out for um, raised beds. So something not really a container and not really in the ground, but probably better than both. Um, raised beds uh, are great for those with mobility and back issues. Um, they improve drainage because they're raised up. Um, so if you've got some compacted soil underneath, you can put a uh, raised bed on top and really get some good drainage for your garden. Um, the soil also warms up more quickly in the spring. The other thing I'll note about this photo is that this was in our old townhouse um, and this was an unused area that was just um, this really sad lawn um, and it was the, the area right over our parking garage um, and I asked our strata council if we could build some gardens there which was approved and then we had I think six families sharing these three beds so um, just you know if you're looking for land you don't have a lot of space be creative and and it doesn't hurt to ask and sometimes you can get a great little project going out of it. So they can raised beds can be something quite basic like this or you can do something quite snazzy and fancy stuff, um, and they can be quite beautiful as well. So uh, you've chosen your container, you know what you're growing in, now it's get time to get ready to plant. Um, step one, the standard advice is always to clean your containers before, your plant, before you plant, and I never do this. I, um, well, I, you know, got a full-time job in a month of two and everything else is going on. So cleaning my containers is usually at the bottom of my list. 
That said, um, I do clean um, the small plastic containers if I'm reusing them to start seeds in. Uh, seedlings are prone to a fungal disease known as damping off and uh, that can persist in the containers. So I always make sure that I clean containers when I'm starting from seed. Um, and that's just a quick rinse in uh, a bucket with a uh, bleach and water solution. So the other thing you wanna do before planting is make sure that your container has a drainage hole. Um, if, it, if your pot doesn't have one, you can, if you're buying it new, you can ask the nursery to, to drill one for you. Um, or you can do it yourself with a drill bit and a ceramic, um, drill in a ceramic bit. Then you want to think about your soil. So you've got two basic choices. A classic potting mix um, is basically a sterile growing medium. So it is designed to um, create good drainage, um, good air circulation, and to provide like a place for the plant's roots to develop. It's not designed to provide a lot of nutrients. So the other option and what I always go with um, is a container mix that has an organic, uh, has organic matter mixed into it. And you're finding these soil mixes ready to go from the nurseries um, more and more these days. It looks a little bit more than like the garden soil that we're used to, um, but it has um, additives that make it um, also work for containers. So something that improves drainage in air air circulation. So either way, do not use regular garden soil. Like don't be going and digging up soil from your garden because that will end up being compacted and it probably has weed seeds and all kinds of things in it. So you're looking for something called container soil, which is designed to provide the drainage and air circulation that container grown plants need. Um, I really like um, something called um, sea soil. The word escaped me for a second sea soil potting mix that's a good one and um, BC made so in short great potting soil doesn't look like the the black gold we strive for in our compost bins and our in our in-ground gardens you're not looking for a ton of organic matter um, or worm count or any of those things um, so the other thing I like to do before I plant I've got my my um, my sea soil good quality potting mix um, I will mix in uh, some organic um, granular fertilizer. So something with a, like, if you're seeing numbers like 20, 20, 20, you know that that's a chemical fertilizer. I always grow organically. This is something that I'm gonna be eating, um, feeding my family. Um, you know, when we go to the store and we might have to choose between paying $2 for a cucumber or $5 for an organic cucumber, sometimes it's a difficult choice to make. But if I'm growing it, I'm going to grow organically. It's, you know, it just makes sense to me. So I'm going to choose an organic fertilizer, something like 444, um, which has a balanced ratio of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are the three main um, nutrients that plants need for growth. Um, gr those granular fertilizers are um, slow release, so they will carry that plant throughout the growing season and provide a good base of nutrients. Um, so moving on from soil, um, locate challenging locations or situations. We all have them. Um, the first, um, thing is, is sun or lack of sun. And you've probably heard that edibles need full sun to do well, um, which is kind of true. Some do for sure. Um, but there are many, including leafy greens and berries and some root crops that actually do not so bad in part shade. Um, I am going to share a link with you in the comments after it's to my blog where you will find um, what is normally a handout at these talks that provides a list of my favorite varieties for growing in containers and it's each uh, one that has um, tolerance for part shade is asterisk so um, you can take a look at that and see um, which can which things will work if you've got a less less than uh, sunny location. So what is full sun, part sun, part shade? Um, most fruiting vegetables, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, um, zucchinis, those, those things that we are planting now starting in June, um, our main season crops, our heat loving crops, those, those are heat lovers. They want the full sun. 
Um, they'll be happiest with upwards of six plus hours of direct sunlight daily, um, as long as their water needs are met. Um, you know, if you're not watering them and they're still getting that much sun, they will not be happy. Um, and that also goes through for our, um, uh, the rest of our main season crops like um, beans or basil. Um, you can see basil here in the foreground cavorting with cacti. And I also like this photo because it shows something which I would refer to as a microclimate, this gravel patio. Um, you can bet that when the sun shines on that patio all day, it, it stores up the heat and it will release that heat over the night. And, and those, plant, those heat loving plants are just loving it. Um, yeah, so that's that's sunlight. Um, wind, um, this can be a, a factor on rooftop decks uh, specifically, but also um, balconies. Um, and wind can shred delicate leaves, knock over um, containers. So something that we want to um, create protection from. And the best way to do that is to um, create a windbreak with a trellis um, and grow something up it. So maximizing that vertical space. And there's tons of things that you can grow vertically, um, like cucumbers or beans or peas or, um, you know, currants. Um, lots, of, lots of tasty things that we can grow as a, as a living screen. The other thing, oh, I'll just mention again, wind. Um, the other thing we can do is to mulch the surface of our of our containers. We will do mulching in our in-ground gardens quite frequently, but we don't often think about doing it in containers. But what we can do is put mulch on top of our containers if wind is an issue, because that will help prevent um, erosion and things from drying out. Um, and grouping our containers together as well to create, to help create stability if you're in a really windy situation. So, give me one second here. Weight, so this is largely a problem um, for those growing on balconies and rooftops. So planters and people and barbecues and all kinds of things can add up to a pretty heavy load. Um, if you're doing any really intensive gardening, I'd encourage you to probably check with an engineer or a builder to make sure your balcony is up to the task. Um, but you, it doesn't hurt to reduce or disperse the load by choosing lightweight containers, by using hanging baskets and railing and wall-mounted planters to kind of um, take the weight off of the floor surface. Um, there's really some fun things that you can do with hanging baskets and, and um, you know, this one's got basil in it, but um, the, the tumbling tomatoes, those hanging basket tomatoes, or um, some window boxes with varieties of herbs and lettuces and all kinds of fun things. So as I mentioned, watering is likely to be your biggest chore with a container gardening. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you can um, have good access to a water. If you don't have access to a tap or a hose, really bad things can happen. Um, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that this is my garden at one point. Um, we moved into this townhouse and I was so gung-ho to get started and I, I, you know, just threw a few things in some containers and then I realized that to water them, I needed to go to the down two sets of stairs to our main floor um, and then truck up and down. So that was fine in the spring when the natural rainfall was helping out, but then come summer, I was like doing this like four or five times a day and I'm, I'm dedicated, but I was like, this is nuts. This is not happening. So the next year we uh, installed drip irrigation and it was a life, like not even kidding. It was a life changing experience. Um, I'm still a huge advocate for drip irrigation for containers, but also in regular in ground gardens as well. Um, I love that you can um, install it and then put it on a timer and it takes care of the watering for you, um, which is great when you're going away on vacation, for example. Um, it's great for a container. This type is like you can put each one, each of individual um, peg into a container um, or you can lay out hosing. Um, it's, it's relatively inexpensive and easy to DIY. Um, and yeah, it's, um, the best thing that I've done for, um, my garden to date. Um, you can also consider these cool, um, 
self-watering containers or sub-irrigated containers as they're also known. Um, you don't need an infinity pool. Um, this one is a super high-end one, which is why it's all fancy looking, but um, here's a cutaway view. So what this does is they're not obvious, they're not self-watering, you need to water, but what you're doing is you're filling the reservoir and that can, depending on the size of that reservoir and the container, that can, can take you through a week. So it's reducing the amount of time that you need to um, be uh, uh, spending in the time watering. Um, back to the self-watering thing for a second, or the, um, the, the irrigation. I will say that it's not perfect. You still do need to um, make, like make sure that the tap, the drippers are hit, hitting everything that you need to, but it certainly does help. So finally, you've got, you've got it all sorted out. You've got your location, you've got your watering sorted in your soil, and your containers. It's finally time to plant. Um, but what are you going to plant? So I started with, what do you love to eat? Um, I spent many years growing radishes because they were, they're super easy. They're really quick to like, they're, they're quick to mature. Um, and then I realized I actually just don't like them. Why am I growing these? Um, that's the wisdom that comes with age, right? Um, so here's delicata squash, which I only discovered two years ago. And my childhood self would be dismayed to find out that I actually love squash. It's certainly not a small space crop, but I make room for it because I love it. Um, and so I make it work. Like if, if we could grow cocoa tree or cacao trees here, I certainly would. Um, so yeah, what, think of what you really like, what you really love to eat. What's really, um, something that, um, that you would love to grow. Uh, what's unusual. So, um, choose some of the rarities that you can't just find at the supermarket, um, or are expensive. So you, unusual varieties such as purple peppers or uh, rapini, um, heirloom tomatoes. Here's an example of one, um, purple calabash, I believe. Even um, heirloom tomatoes are becoming more popular even at mainstream grocery stores, but there's something really cool about growing it yourself. Um, practically speaking, what will thrive in your space? So um, are you growing in part shade? Or do you have a really hot um, south facing balcony? What, what is actually going to work for your space? Um, I'm showing this photo, it doesn't show containers, but what I wanted to show you is this um, walking stick kale here, I'll, right? This, this thing here, this is a kale, it's called a walking stick kale. And I loved how enormous it had gotten, it's obviously very happy there, growing this super narrow shady strip um, behind this house. Um, so just to show you that there is a plant for every every place, every, every plant has a, the right, place um, and just choose for your situation. That said, there are some things that are easier to grow than others. Um, nothing is foolproof. I have killed m so many plants. Um, people always say, well, I'm not a gardener. I, have a, I, I don't have a green thumb. Well, like it's, there's a, it's trial and error. There's a lot that I have killed and that I have learned from. Um, but you know, when I'm talking to beginners, there are some things that I find you do, um, really well, um, easy crops and things designed for container growing. So like not, not planting the, um, the corn in a container, for example, greens do really well. Um, beans are, are super easy The bush beans, garlic is an easy one. Um, most of most of our herbs, um, herbs are definitely a favorite um, for me. And what's going to produce most? So what will give me the most in my limited space, giving me the, the most, most bang for my buck? Um, so think about how much food you're going to be harvesting from each container and is it worth it? Like this container would hold, um, if we're talking about cauliflower, for example, it would, it would produce one head of cauliflower and then you'd harvest the cauliflower and you'd be done. But a plant like a tomato is going to keep producing these tomatoes and you'll get multiple fruits from each pot. So think about productivity as well. Think about whether where this is going to be. Does it have to look good? Is this by my front door? Is it on my kitchen counter? Um, do I, is it purely functional or is it something that I also um, want to look good um, all season? So, which brings me to design essentials. So in a lot of ways, creating a great looking container, uh, 
vegetable or edible container garden is similar to the principles we use for designing uh, an ornamental garden. So we want to think about color, and that can be through containers, foliage, flowers, or fruit. Um, and we often think about color combinations for ornamental gardens. Why not for our edible gardens as well? Um, this is a woolly pocket grow bag with a harmonious planting scheme, um, purples and greens, which are on the cool spectrum. Or we can do something um, color contrast, if subtlety isn't your thing. The blue pot with the orange peppers. Um, this is a a tangerine dream um, orange pepper. Um, so you can really make an impact that way too. Texture is something we can think about as well. That can be achieved through plants or through containers. So like rough wood or smooth glossy ceramic, the fuzziness of this um, Greek or Cuban oregano um, plant. Finally, let's think about form. So plants have such different shapes and plant um, shape can have a dramatic impact when we pay attention to it by repeating or contrasting shapes. Um, so think about the varying um, forms. So upright versus weeping, mounding versus vase shaped, because we can really combine those shapes for an interesting effect. Uh, which brings me to a classic formula for choosing plants for ornamental con container gardens. And I just want to explore how we can do that with our edible gardens as well. So um, one thing to consider is the the rule of three or the odd using odd numbers so if you're putting if you're combining um con plants in a container go for one or three or five um, it just has a more natural uh, look so you can just plant one container uh, plant per container and just vary the form or you can combine three or more plants per container um, and this is a great example of combining form texture and color so the, the formula I mentioned is called um, Thriller, Filler, Spiller. And thrillers are the wow plant that you build a container around. Um, it's generally something tall and upright, something with a bit of structure that will hold its shape throughout the season. Um, color would be a, a big bonus. And so I'll just name some of my favorite thrillers. Um, Swiss chard, like how's that for texture? It's got these wonderful glossy crumpled leaves with jewel toned stems. Um, K, uh, the Swiss chard is one of the darlings of the ornamental edible world. I love eggplant. I love the, the dusty purple um, fruits and the big tropical looking leaves. Um, peppers, we, we saw um, peppers earlier as how they were a focal point. Um, and here they're used more as a filler plant, but you can, as you saw previously, they can also be a, a, a thriller. Uh, kale, and not just ornamental kale, as we see often in fall displays. Um, kale is an, a, can be a really attractive plant. Woody perennial herbs like rosemary, which is here shown under underplanted with sweet alyssum, which is a wonderful uh, flowering plant, not edible, but a wonderful annual for um, attracting uh, beneficial insects. Another thriller I love is our blueberries. Um, this is a brazzleberry uh, peach sorbet um, dwarf blueberry. It looks fantastic in a pot. They have another one called pink icing. Um, and what I really like about blueberries is that they have awesome fall color. Um, in my garden here, this is the blueberry. Um, and I just love that they have that almost like three seasons of interest. They've got flowers in spring, fruit in summer, and then this lovely fall foliage. And as you can see, they really do work in a landscape. You could also consider a tree like Sweet Bay. This is um, a corkscrewed, lollipopped bay tree. These are um, only hardy to minus six. So um, depending on what kind of winter we're having, they might need to be protected, but they definitely do make an impact. Um, or you can consider a dwarf fruit tree. Um, so citrus, as I mentioned, apples um, do really well in our climate or something like cherry, peach, or fig. Fillers um, are your workhorses. This is your mid-height plant, something with a mounding habit usually, or perhaps with great texture, color, flowers. Um, most of our herbs fall into this category. This is a, a Siam queen or Thai basil. Um, I love chives with the little palm, palm heads, um, parsley. Um, I prefer Italian parsley for cooking, but I love the curly parsley in a, in a container display. 
sage um, color and texture. Um, it's an evergreen shrub. Um, love this one. Um, it comes in many different colors and variegations. It even has flowers that insects love, that beneficial insects love, and it tastes fabulous with brown butter and pasta. Um, another uh, more unusual filler might be something like a purple bush bean, and that's some, another way to add some interesting color. Lettuces do really well in containers. You can look for a, a mix of lettuces to make it um, take the work out of combining colors and textures for you. Um, and then pansies or other edible flowers like begonias or calendula, dianthus, signet marigolds. Um, and I really just encourage you in general to um, interplant flowers throughout your vegetable garden um, and not just edible ones, things that are gonna attract those bees and um, butterflies and support our, our wild pollinators. Spillers, so these are your trailing or your creeping plant. Um, I really like to plant dwarf peas. So these are peas that don't need staking. And I usually just tuck the, plant the seeds all around the edge of the container. And they kind of just trail down the side and the pods are preceded by pretty white flowers. Um, not so super prolific that way, but it's a really um, neat way to introduce um, peas into a planting scheme. And peas are really good for soil too, because they um, fix nitrogen from the air and um, add it into the soil. Strawberries. A uh, great way to contain strawberries is by growing them in a pot and kind of keep their, their runners under check. Hmm. Trailing nasturtiums, um, the uh, nasturtium flowers and pods are edible. Uh, the trailing or a container specific um, tomato. Um, and also um, sweet potatoes. So we've seen um, the ornamental sweet potatoes in the market for, for many years. And of course, like the edible sweet potatoes, but this is a newer plant here. And I'm talking about this purple one. Um, this is something that um, is uh, just been introduced, I think, within the last couple of years. And it's a, designed as an ornamental sweet potato, but also with edible tubers once the um, container display is finished. So that was a lot, um, but let's 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 carry on. Um, you've chosen your plants. How do you keep them healthy? Um, so watering regularly, obviously, fertilizing um, every week. Believe it or not, with a with a liquid organic fertilizer. Liquid fertilizers are great for containers because they're fast acting and they are quickly absorbed by the plant. So when we're watering our containers, especially every day in the summer, all those nutrients are getting leached out constantly and we need to replace them. Otherwise the plant will, will suffer. I alternate week by week, um, starting out with fish fertilizer in the spring. For fish fertilizer is high in nitrogen and that um, will help with the leafy green growth. And then I start, start mixing in some, of the, some liquid kelp fertilizer, which is more balanced. And then I usually continue with liquid kelp when it comes to a point in the season where I don't want to encourage so much green, new green growth. And then of course, um, amending your, your soil annually. So if you're growing a perennial the year after year, it's staying in the same pot, you do need to, um, to make sure that um, soil stays healthy. Which brings me to, must I replace that soil? Which is probably the number one question I get. Do we need to replace the soil in our pots every year? We hear that often. Um, so if you're growing annual, something that is only designed to last for one season, um, you're, it, 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 bleh, what you're gonna want to do is replace, uh, take out some of the root ball or take out the root ball um, and replenish the soil. You don't need to completely replace it unless there was a problem with disease or, um, yeah, disease would be the main reason to do that. Um, or if you had some sort of insidious weeds somehow made it into that soil. Otherwise, you're just refreshing it. You're just um, adding some, some fresh uh, soil and some fertilizer, and you're just um, keeping that, that container ecosystem going. If you are growing a perennial, such as a blueberry or a raspberry, um, rosemary, oregano, something that's living year after year in the same pot, um, you can't replace the soil. So what we're going to do is top dress or mulch. So that's just adding a couple inches of uh, good compost on top of that plant every year. You might want to sprinkle in a little bit of the granular organic fertilizer as well. 
um, and just kind of top dressing it. Um, and that those nutrients will make their way into the rest of the soil over the season. Do that at least once a year, spring um, or fall and or fall. So um, maximizing your space. So whether you've got a small patio or a big backyard, you still want to get the most out of it. So I'd just like to share some small space gardening tips that are uh, you can apply to any garden, no matter how, how large or small. Uh, the first concept is called succession planting, and it's a key small space gardening technique and one of the best ways to increase the productivity of your garden. It allows you to harvest a sequence of plants from a single container or plot. So, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so in the handout that I'll link to, um, there's a succession, uh, a section called container recipes, and that kind of spells out some rec recipes for how we can um, plant a cool season crop, main season crop, cool season crop. So succession planting is a concept that essentially um, has us planting something in the cool season, which is now basically past. We're just starting our warm season. So spring, main season, summer, which we're in now, and then the fall. And that's just the idea is, so you plant these cool season crops in spring, and then you swap them out with a transplant, say a tomato or a zucchini or something that is, will thrive in, in the heat of our summer. And then when that's petering out or coming to the end of that season, you're gonna um, put in some cool season crops uh, to get the most out of that container. So speaking of uh, interplanting, um, interplanting means taking planting two or more varieties of plants together so that one plant benefits the other. Um, or taking advantage of plants that grow at different rates or root depths. So for example, planting lettuce with tomatoes. Um, I often will plant my um, lettuce uh, from seed and then when it's time to plant the um, tomatoes, I'll plant the, I'll transplant the tomatoes in. By the time the tomatoes get large enough to, sh to shade the lettuces. The lettuces are actually enjoying some of that shade and they are, they're almost done anyway. Um, another thing that I did before I realized I didn't like radishes was plant them at the same time as my carrots because they, they are ready so quickly, whereas carrots take forever to even germinate. And they would remind me that that's where I sowed my carrots because I could see the radishes coming up. Um, the photo that you're looking at now, it's a completely overgrown mess, but it, it was um, my attempt at a three sisters garden, which is an indigenous planting technique using corn, beans, and squash, and the three complement each other. So the beans grow up the support, uh, the, the corn, which supports the bean growth, the beans fix nitrogen in the soil, feeding the other two plants, and the um, squash shades, the big leaves um, shade the soil um, for preventing erosion and water loss, and they also are kind of prickly, so they protect the corn um, from, from rodents. Um, so the other thing we can do is we can grow vertically, use your walls and railings to support climbers, or use planters designed to maximize vertical space. Um, grow everything we can vertically, peas, beans, squash, berries, um, use, or use planters designed to take advantage of vertical space, like these woolly pockets. Um, these are kind of ugly, I think, but I'll mention them anyway because there's definitely a, a way to maximize vertical space. Um, this is called a green stock uh, product. Um, then there's just something that like this that's uh, a, a green, a homemade green wall. Um, uh, definitely a great way to maximize for vertical space as well. Another method um, for small space growing is cut and come again. This is a method for harvesting greens, such as arugula, bok choy, chervil, chicory, lettuces, of course, um, mustards. And there's two methods to doing it. One is um, when the plants are about four inches high, you just kind of lop them off, um, harvest everything you can, and then water them with like a high nitrogen fertilizer, like the fish emulsion. And then you can, the plants will regrow and you can kind of just repeat, like mow them down, fertilize, regrow, you can repeat that two or three times throughout the growing season. The other method, and the one that I prefer, is just to keep harvesting the outer leaves. So if you, this is your plant, you're taking the bottom leaf off of each one and harvesting around the outside. And the plant just keeps growing and you just keep harvesting. And um, yeah, it, and it keeps the plant looking a little bit more attractive than mowing it all off at the at root level. 
Another way to maximize your space is to extend your growing season beyond the typical spring and summer growing period. So we talked a little bit about succession planting, which does have you growing in those shoulder seasons. Um, but you, there's ways to do that. So you can start or buy your own transplants, allowing you to get things into the ground earlier. So, you know, starting things on your window ledge in February um, for being able to transplant those out when it's warm enough. Um, and then having things ready to go um, right after you harvest. So just, again, never keeping a pot or plot of uh, ground um, bare, always having th something ready to go into it. As the weather cools, we can use cloches like these pretty little glass ones or some row frost protection fabric over um, our crops to protect sensitive plants and extend the growing season. Um, I do this sometimes with green with greens, but often it's it's we don't have a cold enough winter to even warrant it. Um, and then grow a winter garden. So we're in June now, and we're just planting our tomatoes and our zucchinis and our beans and our warm season crops. But it's already time to start thinking about what do I want to harvest this fall and throughout the winter. And that that, that starts, at, believe it or not, now. There's some things that we're planting now. Um, and all the way through to um, late August, September that will feed us throughout fall and winter. So planting cold tolerant crops in midsummer uh, for a fall and winter harvest. Um, winter gardening isn't planting things in winter, it's it, a winter garden is more like a refrigerator. So you wanna get all your plants to kind of uh, a good teenager size um, by the end of October and then they'll, they'll hold throughout the winter and you can harvest them then. So things like carrots, um, corn salad, kale, uh, Swiss chard, um, garlic, um, leeks and parsnips, uh, scallions, even spinach, um, quite cold tolerant. The other thing that we can do is we can just mix in edibles to our ornamental gardens. Um, so this is the photo of the side of my house uh, and I've got blackberry, blueberry, Alpine strawberry, chives, parsley, apple trees, um, hops. Like I've got a lot packed into this garden that's also full of, as you'll see, like dahlias and asters and grasses and other things that aren't edible. Um, so it, there are a lot of beautiful edible things uh, that you can add to an existing ornamental garden and um, kind of increase the productivity of, of that space. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, and I will um, stop my sharing. Do I want to stop my sharing, Lynn? Um, yeah, I think that probably makes sense. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Yeah. Great. OK. Um, so there are some questions in the Q and A, and and there were a couple of questions that came over the mm -hmm. chat and the Q and A about recording. And I yes, I am recording this session, so uh, eventually um, it'll go up on the library's YouTube channel. Okay, so um, the first question is for raised beds. Can I not mix some garden soil? With compost and sea soil, or does it have to be exclusively sea soil or equivalent? Um, so I will answer this live. Yeah, yeah just yeah, yeah. Just, okay. Um, yes, you can definitely mix it. For raised beds, it's a little bit different. You can definitely mix in some more organic matter. Um, there, it, it, they don't have run the same risk of um, becoming compacted. So yes, raised beds definitely mix in some garden soil, compost, sea soil. It does not have to be, you don't strictly have to be ripping open a bag and um, and uh, filling up that. That would be very expensive. Um, and then what are the planting instructions for a Meyer lemon tree? So um, the Meyer lemon tree that I was given, actually my husband was given it by, by my mom who knows that he's a foodie and thought, oh, she'll, he'll love this Meyer lemon tree. Um, but of course I'm the gardener, so I it's ended up being my <laughs> Meyer lemon tree. Um, so it's the um, Phoenix perennials in Richmond um, has a wide variety. I think he probably garden works does as well. 
Um, and um, there's a great nursery on the North Shore. I can't think of the name of right now. Is it Maple Leaf or? Yeah. Maple Leaf. Um, yeah. So um, Meyer lemons, they, uh, they do need um, feeding. So I would probably just transplant. Um, so taking the, 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 the ones that I bought or have, it came in a pot, I would just transplant it into a large container um, and make sure that this, it's got some good um, container soil around it. Again, mix in the granular organic fertilizer and, um, and give it a go. Um, they are taller, hardy to about minus six, which is actually quite amazing when you think about citrus, but um, it's, uh, yeah, th I'm not sure if that answers the question, but yeah, I would just plant it like I would any, um, any perennial, uh, woody perennial and um, fertilizing, watering, keeping it in a warm sheltered location, bringing it in over the winter um, and uh, yeah, hoping for lemons. Um, what do I you recommend for mulches, leaves, grass, wood chips, newspaper? I think my ideal mulch is, well, mulches play a couple of roles, right? So one is that it, it protects the soil um, and reduces weed growth. And um, one thing I'm relying on, on mulches for right now is my cats keep pooping in the garden. So I'm finding that by mulch heavily, they, they're less likely to use it that way. Um, so, but I also want, ideally you're looking for a mulch that's also not just, protecting the soil um, but it's performing some other functions so there's mulches that you can use for tomatoes like to heat the soil um, for example like plastic is considered a mulch actually because it, it it covers the soil and warms it up I don't like using plastic if I don't have to so I, I prefer like a compost because that's going to break down and provide nutrients um, but I, I use a lot of um, of hay like I buy a, 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 ba a bale of hay in fall um, and I use it for mulching my pathways and I, I cover my, t my tomato beds with it. Um, and I, I like that it really does seem to keep the, um, the soil moist and my cats, most importantly, my cats don't like it. Um, <laughs> but that, like compost, I know, but we never have enough compost, right? And it seems like you can never make, make as much compost as you need. So that's my first choice. Um, I like leaves, leaves if they're been broken down. Um, like leak composted for a year. Um, I never use grass because my lawn has so many weeds in it. I'm always nervous to introduce weeds to the garden if I don't want to. And I find that wood chips, um, I don't, I don't love using wood chips. They are there. They take nitrogen out of the soil so they can actually rob nitrogen um, from the soil. So they're okay for like a longer term planting, like under a roto or something like that, where, there's an established plant, but I wouldn't use them around um, annual edibles. Um, what was that tomato in the small white pot? Um, that one is from Burpee and it's called a patio princess. Um, I, I'd love some more tips on building a green wall kind of thing if you have any. Um, yeah. I have never personally built a green wall, but I've had the benefit of watching my neighbor do it. Um, they were they were really po uh, pallet walls were really popular a few years ago, and and what I know about them is that they are um, difficult to keep. Like watering is going to be key, so having some sort of integrated watering system, ideally, where um, you're not having to water all those little pockets. Um, and having again with the the drip irrigation set up so that it can filter down. Um, I'm not an expert on green wall building, but I know um, there's lots of resources out there. Um, there's a local company, the name is escaping me right now, but they do build like professional green walls. But um, yeah, watering is kind of a key thing. And um, I might, maybe I'll write a post on my blog on that. I'll do some research and get back to you, Colin. <laughs> um, okay, what else? If you plant after harvesting garlic, does the smell or taste enter the new planting? That is an interesting question. One that I have never considered. I have never experienced it 
impacting the new planting? No, so I'm gonna say no. Um, what brand of fertilizer do you use? Um, so I, so the granular organic fertilizer that I talked about that basically goes into everything, um, it's a brand called Gaia Garden, uh, G-A-I-A. -A. And that's my, they, they have custom fertilizers for plants and for veggie gardens and all. And I usually just go with the basic, like they're, they're all purpose for fertilizer, the 444. Um, and then, oh yeah. So then the other thing I do is the liquid fertilizers, um, kelp man, like kelp, K E L P man, um, local product. Um, I love, I love that. Um, that is a, is a liquid. So just like adding a little cap full to my watering can when I'm, um, when I'm fertilizing, I'm doing that once a week throughout the growing season. It's a very low, um, like NPK rating, if it means anything. So the, 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 it's not super high in fertilizer, but um, it, it really just adds some sort of like, it's like a tonic for the plants. They seem to love it. My balcony has virtually no sun. Any suggestions, please? I'm sorry. Um, I've definitely been there and it's challenging. Um, like I said, I will be posting a link um, in the chat. Is that the best way to do that, uh, Lynn, to post the link to the, the site there? Yeah, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll Just to make sure one. it's broadcasting to all the attendees. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll do that in a sec. But yeah, so I have that list of things that grow in part shade. Um, I don't know if you remember the, sh the slide that I showed where my daughter was at the raised beds and the, it was the, the three raised beds above my complex's um, garage. That got about two hours of sun a day, direct sun. And I was really, I didn't know if it was going to work or not. Um, and I, that, that became my salad garden. Like it was amazing for greens. And I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised at how well greens did. So I don't know when you say virtually no sun, like if, if we're talking no sun, there's really like most edibles are not going to be happy. Most plants aren't going to be happy. Um, you know, mushrooms, <laughs> mushrooms are fun. Um, <laughs> but if you've got like a couple hours, I would just try doing some greens um in that two two out maybe maybe you got three hours in the peak of summer we got we did grow some peas they weren't super prolific i think that's the thing like you try it and if you're not getting fruit then you know that it's not enough sun um but yeah i would say mostly i would i would turn to greens um there's alpine strawberries so like a um uh, i'm trying to think of the latin name and it's escaping me but um really pretty little strawberries they're tiny and they're um they're super fragrant they're just like uh, unlike uh the strawberries that we're used to and they do well in shade as well um I'm ho i hope that's helpful and then i will um if i can figure out how to um quickly find that link and where i put it on my website <laughs> i'll bring that up and i can look that. for it is it it's on your blog yeah, here. Okay. I'll look for um, it while you're answering questions. Okay. Oh, you know what? I'm just, I found it. I'm just going to put the link. Oh, terrific. And, and I'm going to put, um, in the chat. It's on my freebies page. Um, so it's the first link there. Okay. Um, okay. You know what I think? It may just have gone to you and I because we're panel oh, all panelists. Yeah. And I'm going to. Um, so I want to do all panelists and attendees, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, the next. Please let us know the email address. So there you go. It's so my blog is heavypedal.ca and um, it's under slash freebies. So that I've just included that link in the chat. Okay, uh, Marilyn asks, for container growing, just to be clear, do you start with granular organic fertilizer followed by organic li liquid fertilizer every week during the growing season? Yes, so when I'm planting, when I'm preparing the soil, when I'm actually initially planting things, I am um, mixing in or the granular organic fertilizer, and that's just like the long, slow release. Um, I'm, I, I don't usually start with the, the liquid fertilizer like that same week. It's like, you know, I'll give it a week to settle 
and I'll start with um, depending on what I'm growing. So if I'm growing something that I want a lot of leafy green growth from, I will start with the um, with the uh, fish fertilizer, and, and then I will do the um, the kelp fertilizer, uh, kind of off and on, or alternating with the fish fertilizer after that. So yes, both. Marie asks, when growing food in containers, especially plastic ones, can containers, can any containers work or do we have to look for food safe plastic to avoid leaching chemicals in the soil? What do you recommend? Thanks. Yeah, I would look for food, food safe plastic. I think um, I'm maybe more um, careful than, than some, but I, I, I feel like if I'm growing the food, if I'm growing it for something and I eating I, I want to avoid I want to use like a high quality plastic uh yeah just to avoid anything that might be yeah like we don't really know what's what's coming out of that sometimes so that that would be my recommendation um if you're just looking for uh containers that um like repurposing things um you know sometimes I've done like the metal like the big olive oil jugs, or there's other things that you can use other than plastic too, if you're looking for a way to, to just re reuse um, instead of buying new. Um, Kim asks, I have several small tomato plants I've grown from seed, yay. Uh, the leaves are beginning to curl. Why is this happening and what can I do about it? Um, I'm curious if it's maybe just the variety, like sometimes some varieties of tomatoes are like a potato leaf variety and they they do naturally kind of curl under um and the other reason could be maybe heat stress or drought stress um if it, if those uh, aren't it's hard it's hard to say i wish i this is one instance where you wish it was, <laughs> and you could ask some clarifying questions yeah. um but yeah, I'm wondering. It could it could be nothing. It could just be that that's the variety that you have, where the the leaves are are curling under, and that if it looks healthy otherwise, then I wouldn't worry about it. Um, and then otherwise, I would look at the two main things, which would be um, heat stress uh, or or drought stress. We haven't. It hasn't been very hot lately, um, or the past week or so. So maybe it's a, a water issue. Um, I live on the 15th floor, face west northwest, so don't get full sun until mid to late afternoon. What recommendations would you have for edible plantings? I have a good salad size balcony. Thank you. That's a tough situation, actually. Um, I I have a, an area of my backyard that's the same, and it's tough because like you're in shade most of the day, and then it's like this full on hot summer, mm. you know, afternoon sun, and it's really tough. Um, so what things would I recommend that like getting shade most of the day and blasted with sun for a few hours? Um, I guess the hardiest things really. Um, probably things like zucchini and beans. Um, beans would probably be fine. Um, you could, I'm wondering if you could maybe create a bit of screening with something like, like a bean trellis. Um, you could also try, um, those heat loving fruiting plants, like eggplants, like things that are okay in the heat. And yeah, I'm just, it's, it's tough to think of how many hours that would be, but if you get sun for the rest of the evening too, that might be enough. Try it. But yeah, I, 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 I sympathize with you because that is, that can be a challenging place to grow things. I have a, yeah, I have a similar area I'm thinking of and I, <laughs> yeah, I feel for you. But again, I think it's like a matter of trial and error sometimes and just, um, and just seeing what, seeing what works. Um, someone's asking about slugs. Um, I have them fortunately only in just a couple of pots. So yeah, slugs. Um, have you tried the beer trick? Um, this is, this works like a charm. I take a little, um, uh, cat food, uh, tin and I sink it in level with the soil and I fear, fill it with beer. Um, and they love it. They, um, they go in, they love beer, they drown. And you got to think like, it's not a bad way to go. <laughs> it's considered, right? Um, yeah, they, it, it, it works so well. Um, and it's, you know, it's obviously like you're not introducing pesticides or anything. So that's my, my, my trick. 
Um, if you don't, if you're not a beer drinker, um, you know, some, an orange rind turned upside down. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that they'll also kind of collect under there, or leave that overnight, and then in the morning, um, it just hopefully that they, they've mm -hmm. gathered in the orange rind and you can just throw it away. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the blog address for your chart. Yeah, so that's um, that's in the chat. It's uh, heavypedal.ca slash freebies. Um, when you bring a pot with plants indoors for the winter, what needs to be done to get rid of the bugs? Hmm, that get inside the pot. Great question. This is the kind of thing that I do that my husband hates me for sometimes because I, yeah, I'll be like, do, 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 washing my stuff in the kitchen sink. <clears throat> um, what can be done to get rid of the bugs? I guess you could bring it in and like leave it in a garage for a day and hope they vacate. I'm real, I don't know. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I have a great answer to that question. Um, sorry. What is a good place to buy plants? Do you have any recommendations for interesting plants? Um, you know, I buy plants from everywhere. Like I used to be a bit of a snob, but now sometimes I'll be at Home Depot. I'm like, oh, this looks interesting and it's cheap. So uh, where a good place to buy plants. I mean, I love the specialty nurseries. I love Phoenix perennials and I love Southlands and I love garden works. But um, yeah, I mean, any... Any place is a good buy, place to buy plants. Oh, the farmer's markets, actually. Um, I, I buy a lot of my veggie starts there. Um, mm -hmm. And do I have any recommendations for interesting plants? I have another talk on heirloom and, ed and interesting um, vegetables. Oh, oh uh, well, we might have to have you back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, things that are unusual, things that you can't find in the supermarket. Um, things that, yeah, like, just the different varieties. I think it's, is doesn't I West like Coast that. seeds have a lot of variety. They have tons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They do. But then you're growing from seed, which is a little, little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Nancy's asking any tips on avoiding green potatoes that are grown in potato bags. I've hilled mine a few times, but cannot add any more soil. Interesting. Um, yeah. Green potatoes are usually a result of not being covered. Um, so if you're killing them, and I guess the, if you can't any, add any more soil, I'm wondering if that is because the um, because the pot is full already. I'm not sure that there's much you can do. Um, yeah, if the, if, the, if the bag's full and you can't any, add any more, um, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have any tips on that. My my tip would have been to make sure that the potatoes are are covered um, as they're developing, like the actual tuber is usually what will, uh, if it's exposed, then it, then it does turn green and, and is inedible. But um, I'm not sure that there's more you can do if you, if you can't add any more so soil. Sorry, Nancy. Um, Leanne's asking, is a one gallon container big enough for a lettuce plant? Yes, yeah. Um, in my book, um, small space vegetable gardens. There's a every uh, the, the, there's an A to Z section at the back that has um, each plant, and it's got um, a listing for the depth of soil or container required. Lettuce is one of those ones that it has a, a shallow root system, so four inches is is uh, big enough for that. Um, in big containers, what is the minimum of corn plants to still have good pollination? Okay, so if someone wants to try growing corn in containers after all. I love it. Um, I, corn does need, so corn is one of those plants that's not pollinated by insects. It's pollinated by um, wind and it's got those ta the tassels that we see are actually how it gets pollinated. So it needs to be grown close enough together so that um, those those um, tassels can kind of do their birds and bees. Um, so I think, I mean, I've grown the minimum of, I think probably like a four by four or, or 12, like six by six, like eight to 12 plants, I would say at minimum. If you're high up and less likely that pollinators will find your plants, what can be planted? Great question. Something I also questioned when I was growing on a third floor uh, balcony. Um, 
So some things do better if we're helping out with pollination anyway. So um, zucchinis are a prime example of that. If you um, have ever grown um, zucchinis and wondered why they get to a, small, a certain size and then they turn brown and die, it's poor pollination. So um, what I do just to ensure that my zucchini fruits are being pollinated is I kind of, I, I interfere. So I'll get like a, one of my kids little paintbrushes or a Q-tip or something and I'll take the pollen from the male blossom. The, the male blossoms are the one that don't have a little baby fruit on there and they're just a, a stem. I'll take the pollen from that and I'll um, swipe it inside the, the blossom on um, the female uh, zucchini plant or zucchini flower. Um, so something that where you have to get involved in the pollination anyway might be a way to do that. And then the other thing I would suggest is just try to plant lots of things that will attract pollinators. So um, like the sweet alyssum that I mentioned, um, anything with an umbel flower, so dill or um, carrots, well it's a second year thing, but um, dill, Sorry, my children are having a tantrum outside. Um, <laughs> you can hear that or not. Um, yeah, um, so try to try to attract pollinators, I think would be the biggest thing. And then, um, yeah, and then just uh, something that you might need to get involved with anyway. Yeah. Um, is, that, is that sort of it? Can I, get I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that's, wow, great. Um, thank you so much. That's fantastic. I learned a lot too. I took lots of notes. I'm actually just stunned at the variety that's possible in containers. Yes. In, in it's cool. Animals. I mean, I grow every year. I have my favorites, but every year I try something new. And I think that's what makes it interesting is that uh, like yeah. I always grow something weird. Like, um, you know, one year it was quinoa and then one year I took over a city owned lot and grew wheat um oh, wow. you know like there's i think there's the gardening is like just this big fun experiment and i love the variety of things that we can yeah. grow so that's wonderful wow so i i just um well obviously to thank you so much for such an informative and inspiring talk that was great um and i, I wanted to let everybody know that your book uh, small space vegetable gardens is still in print and uh, it could be purchased from some of our local garden stores, the Van Dusen Botanical Gardens or UBC Botanical Gardens, or even ordered from an independent seller like Pulp Fiction. Of course, Indigo has it online, so just so people know about that. Um, and you know, and thanks also to all the attendees for coming. Um, it, the questions are great, and I know that uh, it makes the whole talk a lot more interesting for it, Andrea. And uh, yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe we'll get you back to talk about heirloom planting sometime. But anyway, I think your kids need you now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm in the shed. I can lock the door. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so okay. much for taking right. time Thank out of your you. busy schedule. It's great. Okay. Bye, okay. Andrea. Bye, Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot.